Good evening. My name is Mike Traugott. I'm the director of the ICPSR Summer Program, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, one of the Blaylock Lectures. This series uh, is presented as a regular part of the Summer Program, uh, three evenings a week. It is uh, named in honor of Tad Blaylock, Hubert Tad Blaylock who was an ICPSR council member and a member of the executive council. Uh, Tad Blaylock was a social statistician and also a social theorist, made significant contributions to sociology. In the um, lecture series this summer, we have uh, invited a series of guests uh, in line with a couple of particular threads uh, that uh, we thought would be of interest to the program participants. Since this is uh, even numbered year divisible by four in the United States, that means it's a presidential election year. And uh, we'll be having uh, a series of four presentations uh, among the Blaylock lectures. Uh, Scott Keeter will be here next week to talk about pre-election polls. Uh, he's at the Pew Research Center. Andrew Gelman from Columbia University uh, will uh, be with us to talk about data aggregation and statistical models to estimate election outcomes. Mary Stegmeyer at the University of Missouri will come to talk to us about forecasting models. But tonight uh, we have with us uh, uh, a special guest and a good friend of mine, uh, Dan Merkel from, from ABC News. Dan is the executive director of elections at ABC News, where he is in charge of uh, the decision desk, election data and projections. Uh, the decision desk is the operation that calls the races on election night. <coughs> at ABC News, he's also responsible for setting and enforcing uh, survey reporting standards for the news division. And he vets surveys and social science studies to determine if they are reportable. Dan also oversees the ABC News Ipsos polling partnership, which conducts online polling using the probability based knowledge panel. Dan has been elected to the Executive Council of the American Association for Public Opinion Research, APOR, five times. He's currently serving as APOR's president for the uh, year 2020 to 2021. He's also served in the past as APOR Secretary Treasurer, Counselor at Large, Conference Chair, and Communication Chair. Dan earned his MA and PhD from Northwestern University in Communication Studies. The uh, title of Dan's presentation this evening is Surveying Voters on Election Day, Methodological Issues and Exit Polling. Dan, the screen is now yours. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm gonna try to share my screen now. So just give me one second. All right. So by way of background, um, my first experience uh, with exit polling was in the 1984 general election, um, November. Um, and I was a sophomore broadcasting major at the University of St. Francis in Illinois. And I didn't really know anything about polling or survey research, uh, but to make a few extra bucks, I agreed to be an exit poll interviewer for the ABC News exit poll on election day in 1984. And so this uh, apparently was big news because the campus newspaper wrote a story about it. And you can see me in the photo there at the bottom. Uh, I'm the guy on the left. Uh, looking pretty cool with my uh, tinted glasses, my members only jacket. Um, and at the time, like I said, I knew nothing about survey research, um, but you can see from the quote in the article uh, that I had the makings of a, of, a, of a budding survey methodologist, even though I didn't really take any methods classes at that point. Um, and so you could see uh, my concern was about non-response bias in the exit poll. And they quoted me as saying, the exit polls cannot be accurate because they are not a good sample of people. Now, the, uh, the, the article goes on to explain my reasoning there. I had to stand 100 feet away from the polling place. I was in a parking lot across the street. And so 
Uh, not uh, every voter passed by me, and, and specifically older voters tended to be dropped off closer to the uh, polling location, and so I was less likely to interview um, older voters. And so, so that, that you know, caused me some concern as a, as a young college student. Um, and so, although I, I did show some signs of being an intuitive survey methodologist, one thing that I wasn't aware of is that there are actually adjustments in the exit poll that can take care of some of these uh, non-response issues, and I'll, I'll be talking about those today. And I guess it's also ironic that my, my first exposure to survey research and, and exit polling in particular came as an exit poll interviewer for the ABC News uh, exit poll, because 10 years later, in 1994, I took a job at Voter News Service, or VNS, in New York, and that was the consortium that did the exit polls for the networks for ABC News, uh, for CBS, CNN, NBC, et cetera. And so I was the um, director of surveys at um, VNS for five years. Uh, and I, as part of my job, I oversaw the, the exit poll uh, survey uh, methods uh, aspect of it. After that, in 1999, I ended up taking a job at ABC News as assistant director of, of polling. And so I've worked, I've been working at ABC News for the past 21 years. And as Mike said, I'm currently the executive director uh, of elections at ABC. And, and he, as he mentioned, one of my duties is to oversee the election decision desk, all of our election day projections, uh, the data and models we use to project the races. And that includes uh, the exit poll data, which I'll be uh, talking about today. <clears throat> so here's an outline of my talk. I'll start with a, a brief history of exit polling and then discuss how exit polls are used on election night and then go into some detail about methodological issues uh, in exit polling, including sampling, uh, the questionnaire, non-coverage, non-response and waiting. And then I'll conclude with a, a discussion of COVID-19 and implications for exit polling uh, in November, 2020. <clears throat> so to start out, uh, what uh, is an exit poll? Unlike um, pre-election polls, that interview likely voters prior to the election. Um, exit polls interview people right after they voted, right after they've exited the polling place. And so that's where you get the name exit poll from. The benefits of, of the exit poll are that you are uh, talking to and interviewing actual voters right after they voted. Compared to um, pre-election polls, uh, phone polls that interview likely voters, um, which can be harder to identify because likely voters are a population that doesn't entirely exist until election day. And so identifying likely voters is an imperfect process and it can be challenging. So in, in contrast, the exit poll, um, when people are exiting the polling place, we know they've actually voted. The first exit poll in the U.S. was conducted by Warren Matosky at CBS News in 1967. And the use of exit polling by the networks grew quite a bit after that, and especially through the 1980s, when uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC all had very large full-scale national exit polling operations. Um, and, and this lasted through 1988, with each of the networks doing their own exit polling. In 1990, the networks got together, uh, those three networks got together with CNN to create a consortium called Voter Research and Surveys, or VRS. And the idea was that this consortium would conduct one exit poll or one set of exit polls um, that, that would be used by all the networks. And the reason for that was simple. Uh, exit polls are very expensive to conduct on a national basis. It entails hiring and training about 2,000 people uh, for a general election on election day. That includes the interviewers, sample precinct reporters, and, and it also includes processing uh, about 100,000 interviewers, uh, about 100,000 interviews on election day in real time to be reported and analyzed uh, in real time on election day. In 1993, uh, VNS or Voter News Service was created to uh, take over from VRS and uh, to the portfolio, in addition to the exit polling, VNS uh, also did the vote tabulation, tabulating the vote at every county across the, across the country uh, for each election. So as I mentioned, I worked at VNS as the director of surveys from 1994 uh, to 1999. And um, in 2003, VNS was disbanded uh, in the 2002 election. Uh, uh, VNS had a problem uh, with a new computer system that they were developing and it, it didn't perform as expected. It performed very poorly. And so at that point, VNS was disbanded 
and the National Election Pool, or NEP, was, uh, was formed. And so in 2003, um, the NEP, which was formed by, by the networks and, and, and the AP, um, they hired uh, Edison Matofsky to do the exit polling starting in 2003. It was a joint venture between Edison Research, uh, headed up by uh, Joe Lenski, and also um, a joint venture between them and Matofsky International, uh, headed up by Warren Matofsky, as I mentioned, but who's considered the father of exit polling. Uh, he, he did the first exit poll in 1967. So that, that started in 2003. Uh, a few years later, in 2006, Warren actually um, sadly passed away. And so since then, since 2006, um, the exit polling has been conducted for the NEP by, solely by Edison Research, and still Joe Lenski is there with his team, and, uh, and they do a great job. So this is the uh, NEP that's in existence today. It's a consortium of ABC, CBS, CNN, and NBC. And so Edison at this point is doing not only the exit polling for us, but also the vote tabulation, again, tallying the vote on election night for, for every county in the country. Um, and, and the reason we do that with them is there is no national um, entity that tabulates the vote on election night, and some states are very slow. And, and without us paying to have the vote tabulated in this way, um, the results would be a lot slower than they are. And so the way Edison uh, tabulates it is a combination of sending people to every county in the country and also uh, direct data feeds from certain counties and certain states. But again, it varies, varies by state. The, uh, the national election pool is run by a, a group of committees uh, made up of members of, of each of the networks. And so there's five committees uh, that, that run the national election pool. Uh, the, the first one, and the, the main one that oversees everything is the steering committee. They're in charge of overseeing all the operations. Um, I'm, I serve on this committee. Um, also, we, we take care of the editorial decisions about coverage and pretty much all the overall uh, decision making. There's also a statistical committee. It advises on uh, methodology and, and statistical issues. There's a survey committee that's uh, responsibilities to design the exit poll questionnaires. There's also a PR committee made up of uh, PR professionals from each network, and then a legal committee made up of lawyers from each network that help us with legal issues, including um, when, when we have issues where we're, we're being held as exit poll interviewers to electioneering, distance on, uh, electioneering distances on election night, uh, which, which do not apply to exit poll interviewers, but, but still some officials try to enforce those distances. And so we, and we have as a consortium uh, also, um, had lawsuits against certain states for trying to restrict our access to uh, the polling place, and 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 we've been very successful in in uh, those law lawsuits over time. So since 2003, I've been ABC News's representative on the uh, steering committee and on the statistical committee, and I've also previously served on the survey committee as well. <clears throat> so at this point, I want to turn to how the data, how the exit poll data, and how the exit polls are used on election night. Um, generally speaking, exit polls play a, a very important part in the media's coverage of elections. Um, they provide accurate and timely information that allow us to cover the most important stories on election night. Who won? Uh, how and why did it happen? What does it mean? So the data are used in two ways. Uh, the first is to project the election winners. And the second is to analyze voting patterns and the meaning of the election. So first, uh, regarding the election projections, the, to project elections, the precinct level exit poll data are used in statistical models to uh, project the winners and losers. Uh, in these models, the exit poll data are combined with, uh, at the precinct level with other data, including past data from the precinct. And after the polls closed, they're combined with actual vote data from a sample of precincts uh, throughout the state as well. And then finally, um, absentee and early voting data are also merged into the models to account for uh, people who did not vote at the polling place on election night. The goal in the election projections is to uh, determine which candidate has won each race at poll closing time or as soon as possible thereafter, but without making a mistake. And so the two key factors, the, the primary factor is accuracy, and then the secondary factor uh, for us is, is timeliness. So certainly, we, we don't want to make a mistake, but we also have to be timely being in the news business as well. So you can think of projections as occurring in three stages on election night. The first, early in the day, uh, through poll closing time, 
is when we're looking solely at the uh, the, Alexa, uh, the uh, exit poll data and the absentee data. And so if we have confidence at that point, uh, at poll closing time, we will project a winner at poll closing time. The networks have agreed not to project any statewide race um, before uh, the last scheduled poll closing time in that state, even though in many cases uh, through the exit poll, we have a good sense of who's gonna win well before that. But we've agreed to wait until poll closing time because of the concern that projecting a race while polls are still open may unduly uh, affect people who are still voting in that state. When we project races on election night, we use a criterion of 99.5% confidence of the 99.5% confidence level. And that's compared to most social science research, which, which uses the 95% confidence level. So at the 99, <clears throat> excuse me, at the 99.5% confidence level, we would, one would expect to have, been just based on chance, one uh, inaccurate projection out of every 200 projections. Uh, but our track record is, uh, in fact, much better than that. Since I took over the ABC News Decision Desk in 2003, we've projected hundreds and hundreds of races, uh, statewide races on election night, uh, without making a mistake. And, and the reason is that we simply don't make a projection once the statistical criterion is met. Uh, human judgment also takes a, plays a big role in election projections because the, stat the statistical criterion of 99.5 uh, percent um, is uh, is evaluated with other factors specific to the state and the race. Um, you know, other factors uh, like uh, other factors having to do with non-sampling error. So the statistical criterion of, of 99.5 percent confidence level is just based on the sampling error. But all exit polls and all models have more than sampling error. There's non-response error. There's non-coverage error. There's measurement error. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about some of those things uh, today as well. Around 40% of all races on uh, election night can be projected at poll closing time uh, based on the exit polls. And then these are, these are the races that are, are, are more lopsided. Um, the second stage of the projections on election night is after polls have closed and we haven't projected a race. And um, what we're doing at this point then is merging in with the exit poll data, sample precinct vote data. And that's where Edison sends uh, people to a sample of precincts across the state to call in the actual vote data from those precincts as soon as the election officials release it on election night. And then, uh, like I said, Edison also collects the county vote at all counties in the country. And so that there's a separate county model that looks at those data. And then uh, ultimately, all the county and uh, precinct data are used in an integrated model that combines all the data. And so that's what we're looking at after the polls close. And many of the remaining uh, races can be uh, projected after polls close, looking at a combination of the exit poll data, the sample precinct data, and the county vote data. The third stage in the projections is if a race is close, late, much later in the night, and at that point we're waiting for quite a bit more data to come in, and we're looking mainly at the county level data. The, the precinct models at this point usually are not uh, going to help us much in a very, very close race given sampling error, and other types of error. So instead, in a very close race, we're looking at the county by county results to see which counties are in, which counties are out, and trying to make a determination as to um, uh, what, what the results will look like uh, in the, at the end of night. And this usually in, entails Edison contacting specific counties and finding out how much a vote is still expected to be out. And then we can look at where it's out and ba based on past voting patterns, try to make a judgment as to uh, whether or not it's projectable or not. One, one criterion that AB, ABC also uses in very close races is that, is that we will not project a race if there's less than a one percentage point difference between the two candidates, even when basically all the votes in. And that's because we've seen in the past that just based on errors in the vote count, the results, the final results on election night can change by up to a percentage point. And so we're, we're, we're very cautious in, in close races. The second way the exit poll is used is analyzing vote patterns, and that's you know, analyzing the meaning of the election. And unlike projections, which, as I said, are, are analyzed uh, or, or, or the models for projections are done at the precinct level, the analysis of the vote for uh, voting patterns um, is done at the individual level. And so uh, these are done using exit poll crosstabs in the Edison system, uh, normally by, uh, nationally and by state Edison. Um, 
uh, creates a crosstab for every, every state we're covering and, and nationally. And the crosstabs include every question that's on the exit poll crosstabbed with each of the vote questions. And so these are uh, pre-formatted uh, in advance. And this is uh, an example of what uh, the exit poll crosstabs look like. Uh, in addition to the exit poll crosstabs, again, these are, so the way this works is the exit poll data come in, Edison will weight the data, and then it'll populate these pre-formatted crosstabs. Because like I said, there's a lot of data coming in on election night, so it all has to be pretty much set up and tested beforehand. And so that's, that's how they're able to do so much uh, processing on election night. But the Edison system also allows us to look at um, custom analyses as well. They have a custom crosstab system that allows you to look at anything that's not in the uh, pre-formatted crosstabs. The crosstabs provide a wealth of data that are used to answer the questions, um, what's the meaning of the election outcome? Why did a, per, a particular candidate win or lose? How did the various subgroups vote? Um, what issues were the most important? And so the crosstabs on this slide here, I know it's a little hard to see because the print's small, um, but these are from the 2018 national exit poll. And so this shows the uh, data for all the, uh, for, well, for some of the questions crosstabbed against the US uh, national house vote. This is just two pages of the crosstabs. The national crosstabs are, are actually many pages long because there are a number of questions and a no number of versions of the questionnaire. So down the left-hand side of the crosstabs are the different questions that were asked, uh, the groups we're looking at, and then so the crosstabs will show the relative size of each group as well as how that group voted. And because the sample size of the national exit poll is very large, it's, it's about 19,000 in this case, uh, you can look at a lot of subgroups that are, are smaller that you typically cannot look at in your normal um, uh, pre-election telephone survey. So for example, from the 2018 crosstabs, we learned that 2018 had the largest gender gap of any uh, national house vote going back to 1982. Um, from the crosstabs, we see that women were much more likely to vote for the Democratic House candidate, and, and men were somewhat more likely to vote for the Republican House candidate. So if you look at um, the first two white horizontal lines there on the left, you see men and women. Um, you see men made up 48% of the electorate and women were 52%. And women voted 59% uh, for Democrats uh, and for Republicans 40%. The opposite for, for men, but not as big of a difference. They voted 51% uh, for the Republicans and 47 for the Democrats. So the 19 point um, uh, advantage for the Democrats among women and the 4% uh, Democratic uh, Republican advantage among men translated into a 23 point gender gap Again, like I said, which was the largest we've seen since uh, going back to 1982. Um, another example, the national exit poll in 2018 also found that 28% of voters were non-white. This ended up being, this was the highest percentage uh, in any midterm election for which we have data uh, going back many years. And, and so again, this, this has been steadily changing since 1990 when, when the percent of non-whites was, was only 9%. So we expect you know, with future elections that that trend will continue as well. So these are the kinds of comparisons uh, we do on election night um, uh, using the exit poll data. Uh, and after election day, the, the exit poll data are still used in analyses, um, you know, depending on uh, you know, what, what story people are working on. And then ultimately, uh, the exit poll data are all archived, uh, the individual level data are archived at places like the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research, uh, so academics and other people can, can use it to further analyze the election. So the way it works is the exit poll interviewers begin calling data into Edison um, in, the, in the mid to late morning on election day. We at the networks usually start looking at the exit poll data at 11 o'clock a.m. on election day. Uh, years ago at 11 o'clock, the system uh, would open uh, and, and pretty much anyone in the news division uh, would be able to analyze and look at the data starting at 11 o'clock. Um, this was some years ago. We, we were having problems at the time with um, um, uh, vote data being leaked uh, during the day, and that was causing a lot of problems, including sometimes changes in the stock market. And so what we did starting in 2016 is that we implemented what we call a quarantine room, and that's where only three members of each network go to a, a room to analyze the data starting at 11 o'clock, and no one else from, from the network is able to see the data until 5 p.m. And so we're you know, cut off from the rest of the world. And so this allows us to look at quality control with the data, start analyzing it, preparing for election night, 
uh, but without having uh, the issue of leaks. And this has proved to be successful because we have not had any leaks uh, since this procedure was implemented in 2006. Now that we're facing a pandemic, uh, we've, uh, to avoid confusion, we have changed the name of the quarantine room and we're now calling it an embargo room. Uh, but it's the same procedure today with a, a few people from each network having access to the data at 11 o'clock and analyzing it from 11 uh, to five. And then when the embargo period lifts at five, um, it's uh, then at that point released to the rest of the people in, in the news divisions. And at that point at five o'clock, the data are reportable. Um, they are reportable with some caveats and restrictions. Um, they're reportable, but nothing can be reported that indicates who's leading in a state or who may win a state before the polls close in that state. Again, given the, the pledge we made uh, in, after the 2000 election. And, and also um, any reporting at five o'clock or you know, up until poll closing time, until we have wave three, um, needs to be reported as preliminary results because uh, results are still coming in. So now that I've um, given you some background on the exit polls, how they're used, I wanna to turn to some more detail on the exit poll methodology, and I will start with sampling. <clears throat> the, the exit polls use a two-stage um, probability sampling uh, process. The first stage is to select a stratified sample of precincts within the jurisdiction that we're interested in, whether it's nationally, uh, by state, or by CD even sometimes, congressional district. Uh, first, we the first thing, the first part of the sampling process is we get a list of all precincts in the state and the vote in a past race for every precinct in the state. And precincts are grouped into geographic regions and regions that are politically ho as homogeneous as possible. And typically uh, we select between three and six um, geographic regions in a state. So this is an example um, of Illinois. Um, this is what the geographic strata in Illinois look like. It's a little hard to see, but geographic strata, geostratum one is uh, up the upper right uh, in a kind of a yellow circle there. And it's, it's Cook County, but the city portion of Cook County. Uh, geostratum two is the suburban portion of Cook County, and that's that little green part there. It, it may be hidden by the video. Um, and then geostratum three are the uh, collar counties around Cook County, that's the purple. Geostratum four, that is the, uh, the northern section of the state, and that's, those are the white counties. And then the fifth and final geostratum are the central and southern counties, and those are the, the ones in red. So like I said, the goal is to have strata that are, as, um, you know, are geographically contiguous, but also uh, politically uh, homogeneous. Uh, and, and the idea is to have the strata to be about equal size in terms of the expected vote. So you see geographically the sizes are way off, but the, the expected vote within each of these geographic regions is about the same in terms of number of voters. So in terms of the partisan breakdown for the state of Illinois, it just as an example, uh, Stratum one, the Cook County city portion is, is, was 84% Democratic in the uh, 2016 presidential race. Um, Cook suburbs was 66% Democratic. The third Stratum, the Collar counties was 53%. Fourth stratum north, the northern section was 42%, and then the southern and central section was 35%. So you can see in this, in this situation, in this stratification, it gets uh, progressively less democratic as you go from stratum one to stratum five. So that's the first step is you have the strata. And then what, what is done is we, we sort the list of all precincts um, by the percent past democratic vote, and this is done within each geographic region. So you have all the precincts sorted by the past vote, and this is done by region or by geographic stratum, and then a systematic sample is taken uh, from, from that sampling frame. Because the list is ordered by geographic region, and then it's ordered by the percent democratic vote in each geographic region, this helps ensure that the, the precinct sample is representative of not only various parts of the state, but also representative of the Democratic and Republican Party vote, uh, both within geographic region and also statewide. And this is especially important because the past party vote in the precincts within a state is very highly correlated with the current party vote 
in the state. So the correlation between the past party vote and current party vote at the precinct level is, is typically in the 0.85 to 0.95 range. And because we have the past vote for all the precincts in the state, we can check the accuracy of the precinct sample uh, before we use it on election day by comparing the Democratic and Republican percent that's estimated from that sample, uh, comparing it to the, the, the whole of, of the state from that past race. And you can do this by stratum and also uh, statewide. And so that's, that's a nice option that survey researchers often don't have. Um, for example, RDD surveys, you typically, or you really don't have good prior data on key variables of interest, such as the vote, like we do uh, with the precinct samples in the exit poll. In terms of how many precincts we select for a state, um, typically uh, state uh, sample sizes range from 20 to 50 uh, precincts, with larger, more heterogeneous states getting more precincts and a smaller, more homogeneous states getting fewer precincts. And also states with more newsworthy races also tend to get more precincts as well. And then for the national samples, uh, we select uh, for the national exit poll about 250 precincts. And in, the, in, in recent elections um, for a national general election between 20 and 25 states will have uh, exit poll cross tabs and then there'll be the national cross tabs as well. <clears throat> That's the first stage of sampling, selecting the precincts to send the interviewers to. And the second stage of sampling it happens within the precinct, and that's selecting a sample of voters uh, at the precinct, within each precinct. And this is done using a, a systematic selection of voters as they exit the polling place. So using, uh, say, every nth voter as they exit the polling place. Uh, an interviewer is hired and trained for each precinct in the sample. Uh, interviewers show up about a half hour before the polls open. They get set up. Uh, they meet the election official. They find the best place to stand, which is uh, as close to where the voters are exiting the polling place as possible. And, and our goal is to get about 100 interviews per precinct. Each interviewer is, giving, is given an interviewing rate on election day, and that's estimated prior to election day based on, on the expected turnout in that precinct. And so for example, if, if it's a small, it's a low turnout primary and we're expecting 100 voters in that precinct, the interviewing rate will be one, meaning the interviewer needs to try to interview every voter. If it's a little bit bigger precinct, it's 1,000 voters, then the interviewing rate is every 10th voter. So, so the interviewers approach voters based on this interviewing rate as they exit the polling place. Um, and there's also a pre-programmed um, uh, part of the system that determines if the interviewer on election day is getting too few or too many uh, interviews. And if necessary, that interviewing rate can be adjusted on election day. So the interviewing rates applied by the interviewer, the interviewer ap approaches the voter as they exit and tells the interviewer that they're conducting a confidential survey of voters, asks them to fill out a self-administered questionnaire and to put it into a, a ballot box. Now, as an aside, some organizations have in the past conducted exit polls by having the interviewer administer the survey instead of having it being self-administered. And, and it's not really a good idea for a few reasons. One, you have a greater possibility of non-response bias compared to self-administered. Uh, two, some voters are more likely to refuse to fill out the questionnaire because they don't want to verbally, uh, uh, verbally say who they voted for. We, we find that people don't really have a problem saying who they voted for in a self-administered form. But, but verbally, they may, some may be reticent to do that. And then third, if you have the interviewer administer the survey, then you're taking up a lot of their time, and then it ties them up such that they're not able to keep up with their interviewing rate, and then they're, they're missing voters, and that, that increases non-response as well. In terms of tabulating the data, uh, since we need the results in real time on election night, the interviewers call in the results three times during the day, and they read the results in over the phone, and so for the vote questions, what they do before calling in the, the results is they tally the results of the vote questions, read in the tallies of, of, of those results uh, for the vote questions. Those are used in the precinct models for the projections. And then at the individual level, um, the system asks for a subsample of uh, questionnaires and the interviewer reads in a subsample of questionnaires uh, the, at the individual level, question by question. Uh, like I said, for a random subsample of, of questionnaires. So that's the general procedure with sampling. And the last aspect of sampling that I wanted to mention is sampling error for exit polls. 
because the the sampling design uh, because of the sampling design for exit polls, uh, the sampling error is larger than for simple random sampling. So the traditional uh, sampling error calculation using um, the square root of p times q over n will underestimate the sampling error in exit polls. And that's because the exit poll is a cluster sample. And like any cluster sample, the more a variable is clustered or the more that uh, the results vary across precincts, uh, the larger the sampling error for that characteristic. So for example, race, candidate vote, some political opinion questions, those, those types of questions are highly clustered by precinct. Whereas other variables, for example, male or female, is uh, fairly similar across precincts and is less clustered. So the more clustered the variable, uh, the higher the sampling error for that variable will be. Th this increase in sampling error due to clustering is measured by what's called the design effect. And this is a, a statistical expression that uh, relates the variance in a complex sample like an exit poll to uh, the variance in simple random sampling. And through some estimation, we've determined that the exit poll design effect for the vote question and for related uh, political opinion questions, the design effect is approximately 2.25. So a design effect of 2.25 translates into a, a 50, uh, five zero, 50 percent increase in sampling error uh, relative or related to uh, compared to simple random sampling. So for example, the margin of error of a simple random sample of 1,000 is about three plus or minus three percentage points, whereas the margin of error uh, of an exit poll of 1,000 with the design effect is about four and a half percentage points. So you need, need to factor this in when analyzing exit poll data, when calculate, calculating the margin of error for exit polls, and also if using traditional uh, statistical software packages like SPSS, uh, you also somehow need to factor this in because um, this SPSS will, will understate the, stand, uh, the standard errors. All right, so that's sampling. Uh, moving on then to the questionnaire. I mentioned that the exit poll uses a self-administered questionnaire. This is what um, uh, an exit poll questionnaire looks like. This is from Wisconsin. Uh, in 2012, but this is the same format that's been used in subsequent uh, elections. Uh, there are two pages shown here uh, side by side, but when it's used on election night, it's actually printed uh, on front and back. So, so, so basically, um, I'm just showing it here because it's easier to show it this way, but th these would be printed on one sheet of paper front to back, printed on an eight and a half by five and a half piece of paper, which is half the size of a standard piece of paper. In the past, the questionnaire was twice the size, uh, eight and a half by 11, uh, but through some research, we found that response rates suffer with larger questionnaires. So we switched to the smaller questionnaire uh, 10 years ago in, in 2010. One drawback, obviously, of a, of a smaller questionnaire uh, is that it limits the number of questions that, that can be asked. So to get around this, uh, we use multiple versions of the questionnaire in a state and nationally, and these versions are interleafed on a, a questionnaire pad. And so um, we're able to ask more questions uh, that way, but also uh, still being able to keep the smaller version uh, of the questionnaire. A couple of questions on the, on the question form itself. Um, on opinion questions, we try to limit the number of response categories. Uh, so if you see question L, which is on the upper left of the second page there, um, it asks about the most important issue, has four response categories. Uh, we find that that's, that's, that's an optimal number on, on an exit poll questionnaire. We, we did experiments with more issues on the issues list, uh, seven and, and nine categories, and we found some significant uh, primacy uh, effects, meaning uh, people were more likely to pick items that were first on the list when we had seven or nine uh, items. But with the shorter list, that, that has not been an issue. Also, some years ago, we, we stopped using a check all that apply format of a question. Uh, back uh, earlier, VNS used to ask respondents to check all that apply to them from a, li a longer list of issues. Uh, so they would have a list of items such as married, are you married, are you currently employed, uh, military veteran, and it just you would just check the ones that apply to you. Uh, we did some split half experiments, and we found that this led to a, a significant underestimation of the, of the marginals for those questions. Uh, so as one example, um, some years ago, we, we experimented uh, asking the religious right, uh, are you a member of the religious right political movement? We did a split half asking it as a yes, no question, and also putting it as part of the grab bag. 
And so it was 19% uh, on the uh, yes, no question. It was 6% on the check all that applied. So since then, we've been using um, standalone yes, no questions everywhere instead of the grab bag. And I'm not sure you can see it here. Uh, just, the videos may be covering it, but um, question R asks, are you currently married? Yes or no. And so that's an example of a yes, no question. Again, the drawback is yes, no questions take up more room, but the positive is, is the data are, are more accurate. So that's the questionnaire. Uh, moving on to exit poll non-coverage, then the next methodological aspect I'd like to talk about. Exit polls, uh, by definition, um, they interview voters as they leave the polling place on election day. So there is not a non-coverage issue for those who don't vote at the polling place on election day. Um, either they vote by mail absentee or they vote early in person at a polling place, but they do it before election day. So obviously if you're exit polling on election day, you're not gonna get the, the mail-in voters and you're not gonna get the people who, who voted early uh, before election day in person. When I first started doing exit polling in 1994, the, the non-coverage was quite small. It was less than 10% of, of, the, of the, less than 10% of voters were voting absentee or early. Uh, you can see the significant increase in absentee and early voting over time in the, in the chart here. Looking at it for presidential years, it increased from 12% in 1996 to just over a third in 2008 and 2012, and it was 42% in 2016. Uh, given COVID-19 this year, uh, and given what we've seen so far in the primaries, we're expecting mail in and early voting will be um, quite a bit higher in November, uh, 2020. And so we, we solved the non-coverage non issue in, in one of two ways. The first is to conduct a telephone survey with absentee and early voters, and then combine that with the exit poll data on election night. And then the second, and, and so, that, so that's what's done, for example, for the national exit poll. Uh, and it's also done for states with a significant proportion of absentee and early voting. The second way is to, and this is a relatively new uh, procedure at Edison, uh, is to um, conduct exit polls of early voters in states that have high rates of early voting, early in-person voting. And so Edison has done that in some recent elections, and we found that to be a very accurate way of, of interviewing early voters. And so what happens there is uh, we, sample in, uh, we sample early voting locations, and we sample time uh, in, the, in the lead up to election day, and we send interviewers to interview at these early voting locations, just like, uh, um, just like we do with an exit poll, but it's not election day, it's prior to election day. And like the telephone polls, these data are then merged in with the exit polls on, uh, on election day. So that's, that's the non-coverage issue. Non-response is the next uh, methodological aspect that I wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, non-response and then also some of the weighting we do to adjust for non-response. So response rates and exit polls are still very good, as you can see here. Um, I, I, it, the video may be cutting off the, the right side, so I'll tell you what that is. But um, so this chart, sh uh, this chart shows the response rates for the exit poll going back to 2000. You can see response rates did not vary much from 2006 through 2016 when they were in the, the mid to high 40s. Um, in 2018, which may be blocked by the video here, it, it actually dropped a little bit. Um, uh, from 2016 to 2018, and in 2018 it was it was 41 percent. But even at 41 percent, the exit poll response rates are still much higher than the response rates for po phone polls, which have been in the single digits uh, for for about the, the last decade. There are two types of non-response in exit polls: refusals and misses. Refusal is where the exit poll interviewer approaches a voter and that voter declines to participate. And a miss is when the interviewer, the, sam the um, sampling interval um, uh, selects a voter, but the interviewer is not able to approach that voter or misses the voter for whatever reason, be it uh, they're, they're busy talking to another voter or simply that that voter did not pass by them. So refusals and misses, um, th that makes up the non-response. Refusals make up about three quarters of the non-response and misses make up about a quarter of the non-response. When uh, conducting the exit poll, we have the interviewers keep track of the refusals and misses. So not only was it a refusal or a miss, 
but we have them keep track of um, a few characteristics of uh, the demographic characteristics of the, the people that refused or were missed. So the interviewer estimates the age, race, and sex of the non-respondents. Uh, for age, they, they estimated in categories, three categories, 18 to 29, 30 to 59, and 60 plus. Race is uh, estimated as black and non-black, and for sex, obviously male and female. And so we found that the, estimate, uh, the interviewers do a very good job. Um, well, they do a good job in general. Uh, they do a better job, as you might expect, on race and sex. Um, and not, not quite as well on age, but it's still, it's, it's still um, a lot better than, than nothing. Um, so these data are used, uh, these data are also read in by the interviewers on election night. And these data then are used in a non-response adjustment for the exit poll. And this is important because we find that um, older voters, for example, are less likely to fill out the exit poll questionnaire than younger voters. And this has been a, a very consistent finding over the years. Uh, the non-response differences by sex and race are smaller and they vary election to election. Uh, sometimes there's differences, sometimes there's not, but so it's, it's still important to adjust for these categories as well. Uh, research that I've done with uh, Murray Edelman uh, finds that a number of factors affect non-response rates. Um, so the first one I have already mentioned is interviewer length, uh, I'm sorry, questionnaire length. Um, longer questionnaires have lower response rates. Uh, the second one is the interviewer's location at the polling place. Uh, the further the interviewer has to stand from the exit door, the lower the response rate. Interviewers are instructed to stand as close to the exit as possible, uh, but their ability to do so varies considerably state to state, precinct to precinct, even within a state. Um, and so in some cases, they get a great position, right? You know, at the door inside uh, and, and you know, one exit and everyone passes them. In, other, in, in some other cases, the interviewers have to stand 25, 50, and, and in some, some places, 100 feet away. Again, that, you know, in, in some cases, the election officials will have, have the interviewer stand at the electioneering distance, we work hard on election day to make sure that the, the um, polling place official knows it doesn't apply to us, but we're, we're not always successful. But in, in, in a lot of cases, we are. The third factor affecting response rates or non-response is that interviewers who have uh, problems with the election official uh, tend to have a lower response rate. Uh, fourth is interviewers when they have trouble keeping up with the interviewing rate have a lower response rate. And again, we try to make the interviewing rate as, accurately, as accurate as possible, uh, and then uh, change it on, on election day if possible, because we don't want to overwork the interviewer, and that also leads to lower response rates. And then the final factor is uh, interviewer age and voter age. Our research shows that younger interviewers have lower response rates than older interviewers, and separately, older voters are less likely to respond to the exit poll than younger voters. In addition to that, we find an interaction uh, between interviewer age and voter age in terms of the response rates. This chart shows the response rates uh, by age of interviewers and age of voters. So across the bottom axis is interviewer age and the different colored bars represent the different voter age groups. So the first, as you can see, uh, looking at the dark blue bars, uh, those are the older voters. If you compare them to the purple and red bars, you see that in every case, older voters have lower response rates, regardless of the interviewer's age. Second, again, looking at the blue bars, uh, the response rates for older voters vary quite a bit by interviewer age. Older voters respond much less often to younger interviewers. Middle-aged voters show a similar but less pronounced trend. Uh, those are the purplish bars in the middle there. And the response rates for younger voters uh, are less influenced by interviewer age, those are the red bars, younger voters are almost as likely to respond to interviewers of any age. So therefore, from this, it's apparent that older voters are not as comfortable interacting with younger interviewers, whereas the opposite uh, does not appear to be the case. While we do try hard to maintain high response rates, it's noteworthy that exit poll response rates are not correlated with the error in the exit poll in terms of the vote. So this is a slide that, that comes from a book chapter on exit poll non-response that Murray Edelman and I wrote for uh, the Groves et al. book, Survey Non-Response. Um, this, this chart shows a scatter plot of uh, precinct level 
exit poll response rates and error in the exit poll estimates. So we've studied this in, in many elections since, and we find over time little to no correlation between response rates and error in the exit poll estimates. Exit polls with relatively high response rates tend to be just as accurate as those with lower response rates. But no, this is, this is not the same thing as saying there's no non-response error in exit polls. Uh, there certainly can be. It's just that the, uh, the response rate doesn't, doesn't predict uh, the error. So in addition to non-response adjustments that I mentioned for age, race, and sex, the exit poll is also weighted to our best estimate of the vote, which is our key, depend key dependent variable. So the vote estimate comes from the actual vote count on election night, and that gets more accurate as more vote comes in. Um, and so because of this adjustment, you will notice that the final exit poll data, the vote closely matches the final vote. And before polls close, before we have um, uh, actual vote, um, we, we, we also make an estimate of what the final vote will be, uh, taking into account any kind of non-response error. Edison has a model they, they recently developed that, that provides a little better way of, of estimating what the vote will be in a multivariate model. And again, we use that estimate of the vote to, to weight the exit poll as another type of non-response adjustment. In addition to those standard ways of weighting uh, the exit poll for non-response, uh, in addition to that, in, in the 2018 election, a new weighting adjustment was added to the exit poll for age and education by race. And so given that this is a new adjustment, I wanted to talk in a little more detail about the improvements that were implemented by the NEP uh, in 2008 and talk specifically about what was done, how well it worked, and then the implications for exit poll trend analysis. That is, given this new weighting, uh, this change in weighting, is it still possible to effectively uh, do trend comparisons to past exit poll data? As I noted, uh, before 2018, on the left-hand side, the exit poll had used these two weighting adjustments for age, race, sex, and for the vote, uh, to, uh, the vote by region. And, and on the right side, I'll talk about some of the new adjustments we did. But first, I just to give a little background on it, um, as, as I think you probably all remember, education played a particularly important role in the 2016 presidential election both in the analysis of the election outcome and also in the evaluation of the performance of the 2016 pre-election polls. So for example, APOR's ad hoc committee on the uh, 2016 pre-election polls concluded, quote, adjusting for the overrepresentation of college graduates was critical, but many pre-election polls did not do it. And like many pre-election polls, the exit poll also did not adjust for education. Uh, weighting in the exit poll is fairly straightforward for age, race, and sex. We can do that based on observation by the interviewer, but education is not observable in the same way. So prior to 2018, there was not uh, a weighting adjustment done for education. In 2018, my colleague uh, at ABC News, Gary Langer, uh, and some of his uh, colleagues published uh, an article in POQ, Public Opinion Quarterly, which highlighted the issue with education in the exit poll and also with age. Uh, they looked at the 2016 election, they looked at the demographics comparing the exit poll with the ABC Post uh, final pre-election tracking poll um, using uh, Mr. P or multi-level regression with post stratification. So they compared the exit poll, the ABC Post poll, and they and, and also used the uh, CPS voting supplement. So they compared these three surveys to each other. So the CPS, and the uh, ABC post estimates were comparable um, uh, across uh, the, a number of demographic characteristics. The exit poll, in fact, was comparable across some of the demographic characteristics, but not comparable when it came to education and age. And so, so I just have education and age here on the chart comparing the three surveys. Um, they found significant differences, uh, like I said, for age and education. So if you look at age, for example, Looking at the 65 plus age group on the bottom left side of the chart, 24% in the ABC post poll and in the CPS uh, were 65 plus compared to 16% in the exit poll. So even though there already was an age adjustment in place, clearly it's an imperfect adjustment as those over 65 were still being un underrepresented. And for education, 
Uh, you see on the upper right, um, in the, um, the high school or less group, 30% in the po ABC post survey and the CPS survey were high school or less and 18% in the exit poll. And then below that, and when it was categorized into uh, no college degree and college graduate, uh, about 40% um, uh, in the ABC post poll and CPS uh, were college grads and it was 50% uh, in the exit poll. So in an effort to refine and improve the education and age weighting in the exit poll, Edison did a deep dive comparing education and age in the exit poll to the CPS voting supplement nationally and in states and uh, across a number of elections. And what they found was that the, the understatement of age and the overstatement of education uh, didn't vary much over time. And further that for education, the overstatement of the percent college educated in the exit poll was more pronounced among non-whites than whites. And so for the new weighting adjustment on the right side there, Edison added an adjustment to the exit poll data that uses a ratio of the past CPS percent in that, in that category, a ratio of the past CPS percent over the past exit poll percent, and applies that to the current exit poll data within, within these categories that are listed here for age and for education by race. The, these exit poll adjustments, uh, weighting adjustments, were added to the existing exit poll adjustments that are, that are on the left side of the screen. So they don't replace the adjustments, they're just added to them. At the same time that we were looking to improve the education weighting, we decided to take a fresh look at the education question used on the exit poll, both in terms of the wording of the education question and the placement of the ed education question. So, on the left side is the wording uh, for education that was used prior to 2018. And on the right side is the new wording put in place for 2018. The new wording, uh, you know, the idea with the wording on the left was it is a little more compact and, and some things were collapsed. Um, but the new wording that we came up with um, was based on some research we did after 2016. Uh, the new wording takes up three additional lines. And while space is limited on the exit poll questionnaire, we did feel the change in wording uh, was an improvement and, and justified the additional space. The main change is that we split out some college and associate's degree into two separate categories. And we also made the post-grad category more restrictive, but also more specific. And so, like I said, in some testing, we found that, that these changes made it more accurate. In terms of the question placement, before 2018, the the education question was uh, typically on the back side of the exit poll questionnaire, and we decided to move the education question to the front side of the questionnaire whenever possible. And that's because in some research that we did after 2016, we found that non-college educated respondents were more likely to skip the back side of the questionnaire, and that, that also was having a little bit of an effect. It's, it wasn't a huge effect, but there, there is a small percentage of people who, who, who failed to flip over the questionnaire, even though it clearly says, please flip over the questionnaire. And like I said, those people tended to be less educated. So anyway, getting back to the new weighting uh, for 2018, the first question I looked at is how well did it work? And one way to explore this is to compare the exit poll estimates to other high quality surveys to see how well they line up, sort of like uh, uh, Gary Langer and his colleagues did in that, in that POQ piece. So I did this for 2018, by comparing the national exit poll uh, to the CPS voting supplement and also to the final ABC post poll from 2018. So first a comparison uh, of the uh, size of the demographic groups. This compares the exit poll to the CPS. And you can see these are the marginals for the various demographic groups. You can see that the demographics uh, line up very well. And of particular interest, you notice the close correspondence for age and education. Um, definitely much closer than we've had in the past. Uh, for the 65 plus age group, there's a one point difference between the surveys. For the college grad group uh, and the uh, no college groups, there was a two point difference. So, so definitely an improvement compared to 2016. Next, I compared the um, exit poll to the final ABC post poll. Uh, the CPS does not ask the vote question in their survey. And so the benefit of comparing to the ABC post poll is that it allows us to not only compare the size of the demographic groups, but also to look at the vote by, by each of the subgroups. 
So just to give an overview of the, these two surveys and some of the uh, methodological differences between them, uh, the, the ABC Post poll is produced for ABC News by Langer Research and Associate by Gary Langer. And the field work of the sampling and data collection is done by APT Associates. Um, the ABC Post poll is one of the more well-respected polls uh, and including an A-plus rating by uh, 538.com. Both the ABC Post poll and the exit poll use probability sampling. Um, the Post poll, ABC Post poll is RDD, whereas I mentioned the exit poll is a cluster sample. Uh, but there are some other various differences in methodology between the two polls in terms of mode. Uh, the ABC Post polls a telephone survey, uh, and the exit poll, like I said, is self-administered at the polling place with uh, uh, a phone poll of absentee and early voters. A difference in, in the population represented, ABC Post polls likely voters, um, the NEP exit poll is actual voters, and then the phone poll of early voters. And then in terms of the weighting, uh, the ABC Post poll weights the full sample to census demographics for age, race, sex, and education. And then they pull out the likely voters after that. And then as noted for the exit poll, uh, it's, it's an adjustment for age, race, sex, based on observation. Uh, and also uh, the new adjustment uh, that I mentioned uh, using the ratios of the past CPS over the past exit poll. And then, like I said, the exit poll is weighted to match the actual vote. Uh, the ABC post poll is not. A couple other differences between the polls. The exit poll has a, a much larger sample size. Like I said about the national exit poll is like 19,000 respondents. Um, much larger than the ABC Post poll, which is uh, just under a thousand respondents. And of course, there are some different, uh, slightly different, uh, different uh, question wordings um, uh, in some of the questions I'm looking at, but not, not dramatically so. <clears throat> so this chart uh, compares the top line horse race results for the national house vote between the ABC Post poll and the exit poll. You can see the, the estimates are very close to each other. The ABC Post estimates on the Demerep candidates are each one point lower than the exit poll, and that's because the ABC Post poll had 3% undecided. I haven't percentaged them out in this analysis, mainly because these are the final estimates that were reported right before election day. But even so, the ABC Post estimates were very close to the exit poll, which as I noted, the exit poll is weighted to the final actual vote. This slide compares the marginals of the demographics between the two polls. And again, overall, the results between the two polls are very similar, even given some of these methodological differences that I mentioned. And in particular, the comparison indicates that the new, again, the new education and age adjustments uh, worked as intended. Um, the 2018 percentages uh, are close for age. And on the right side, you see those without, with and without a college degree uh, were, were uh, pretty much exactly on in, in both the surveys. The next uh, comparison I did was for uh, the marginals for a group of political opinion and economy questions. Um, and so again, the results are similar. The exit poll did, does have slightly more people identifying as either a Dem or Rep uh, uh, than, than the ABC Post poll. I think that's likely due to a, a difference in the question wording between the two polls. And also I think in the exit poll, given that people have just voted, they may be less likely or more likely to pick a party and less likely to say they're, they're independent. So that might be one of the reasons for the difference there. This, um, this chart shows now the percent Democratic House vote by each of the demographic groups. Again, something we were not able to do with the CPS data. Um, and so again, there's a, a fairly close correspondence here. It, looking at age, it appears as if there may be differences for the 18 to 29 and 30 to 39 categories, but none of these differences, uh, none of the differences on this page, including the age differences, are statistically significant uh, given the, the lower sample sizes, for example, in the ABC Post poll for the 18 to 29 and 30 to 39 groups. Here's the same analysis the percent Democratic House vote by the political economy, uh, uh, political opinion and economy questions. Again, the percent Democrat, uh, percent Dem vote for each of the groups, uh, again, are fairly similar. Only one of the comparisons in this graph, uh, graph uh, is uh, one of the differences is statistically significantly different. And that's for those who approve of, of uh, Trump on the upper, upper right there. You see the percent Dem among those who approve of Trump in the ABC Post poll was 4% and was 11% in the exit poll. Um, so, but again, even in this case, from a practical standpoint, uh, the conclusion one would draw from, from the data for these two groups does not dramatically differ between the two polls. So like I said, even though there are some methodological differences between these two polls, 
the results were consistent across the, the various variables for the marginals and the vote. Uh, but notably for, for the weighting that I talked about, um, they were consistent for education and age. Uh, uh, so again, an improvement from 2016 and, and showing the, the efficacy of the new weighting adjustment in 2018. So the comparisons that I just made are using the final exit poll data that are weighted to the actual vote uh, after election day. And so I wanted to also look at the effectiveness of the weighting adjustment earlier on election day uh, at, at five o'clock. So uh, as I mentioned before, at five o'clock is when we could start reporting the exit poll estimates. And so I wanted to do a comparison of what the exit poll estimates looked, at, looked like at five o'clock in the exit poll, uh, the national exit poll, compared to the final weighting after it's been trued up to the final vote results. And so this chart compares the five o'clock data to the final exit poll results. Um, and this chart is for the marginals in the exit poll. And so what that is, it's the percent men, it's the percent women, it's the percent college grads, the percent approved of Trump. And so you can see here that there's a very close correspondence uh, between the results at five o'clock PM and the results uh, at the end at the end in the final weighting. And the average difference uh, between uh, the, two, the two weightings was um, about a half a percentage point, uh, and all of the differences uh, between the two weightings were, were two percentage points or less. This is the same chart looking at now the vote within each subgroup, so the percent Democratic House vote within each subgroup. So this is the percent Dem among women, the percent Dem among men, the percent Dem Democratic support among uh, those who approve of Donald Trump, for example. And so the average difference here, again, between the five o'clock PM weighting and the final weighting was about one percentage point and 93% of the differences were two points or less. There are two uh, differences kind of in the middle of the chart there that kind of stick out. Those are the two largest differences were six percentage points. Uh, these were two groups where um, they both had very small sample sizes and so there was more variability in the estimates. But overall, these two graphs show that the five o'clock estimates were very good and that the new weighting was effective starting at the initial data release at five o'clock in addition to being effective uh, at the end of the night. Finally, I wanted to uh, look at the impact of the new weighting on exit poll trend. Uh, again, given that the weighting uh, was changed in 2018, is it uh, still possible to effectively do trend comparisons to previous exit poll data? So this, uh, I did this by looking back at the 2014 and 2016 uh, national exit poll data that Edison, uh, uh, I had, uh, they uh, applied the new weighting to the uh, previous data and then compared those, um, the actual results we had in 2014 and 2016 to the weighting uh, using the new weighting approach. So this slide, shows the 2016 national exit poll, the original weighting compared to the new weighting um, for all the size of group estimates, uh, except for the age and education variables which were used in the weighting. And you can see that there was minimal change from the original weighting to the new weighting. The average difference for the size of group marginals other than age and education was just under a half a percentage point and all the differences were two percentage points or less. This is the same chart for 2014. Again, uh, very, very similar results. And then looking at the vote by subgroup, this is the Clinton vote by uh, each of the subgroups in the 2016 exit poll. And uh, here too, we see minimal differences between the original weighting and the new weighting. And this also includes the age and education categories in it. And so the average difference here, again, was half a percentage point and 99.6% of the differences were two points or less. And this is the same chart for 2014 for the national house vote. Again, uh, very similar results to 2016. So my, my conclusion from all this is that, um, first of all, the, um, the new weighting approach in 2018 was, was successful. It improved the representation of age and education in the exit poll. Uh, secondly, the new weighting uh, was uh, effective starting at the initial data release starting at five o'clock. And then finally, um, as for implications for trending to past exit poll data, um, there, there was a minimal impact uh, on the size of group marginals, uh, except for obviously the age and education marginals. 
uh, but uh, and, and there was a minimal, a minimal impact on the subgroup uh, for all subgroups, including the education and age categories. Uh, and so that means uh, it's possible to use the previous exit poll data for trend comparisons, uh, except for uh, obviously the age and education marginals. A question I often get is, if we are weighting up educated voters, more ed uh, if we're weighting uh, up less educated voters, and we're weighting up older voters, why don't the vote results by subgroup change more? And the reason again is that the exit poll results are also forced or weighted to our best estimate uh, or to the actual vote. And so that trues up or normalizes the vote estimates within the subgroups so they, don't, they didn't end up changing that much. All right, so that, that wraps up my discussion of the exit poll methodology, specifically the section on non-response and weighting. And so I just wanted to move uh, briefly to uh, talk about the implications for exit polling in 2020, uh, given, given COVID-19. Uh, one, one implication that I've already mentioned is that we're, we are expecting a higher percentage of mail-in and early voting this year because of COVID-19, and we've already been seeing this in the primary elections that have been held recently. So what that means is we have to increase the proportion of interviews conducted by phone for mail-in voting, and then also increase the proportion of interviews uh, in person exit polling at these early voting locations where people are voting uh, before election day. One important question though for exit polling is how will COVID-19 impact the in-person exit polling operation? And Edison has been uh, testing out uh, various uh, changes to the exit poll procedures uh, during the recent primary elections. Um, some of the new procedures they've been testing include um, asking interviewers during their morning check-in about their COVID-19 symptoms, requiring interviewers to wear a mask while interviewing, um, placing the exit poll materials on a table. Uh, this seems to be a key, a key change. Typically, interviewers will approach the voter, come right up to them, hand them a pad uh, with the interviewer, uh, with the questionnaires on it, hand them a pen or a pencil, and, and get very close to them. What, and, and, and we have not typically uh, previously uh, had them have a table uh, set up there. But what, what, what we're finding is that um, with a table set up uh, and approaching the voter from a six foot distance and, and, and instructing them to go pick up a questionnaire and a, a pencil from the table, that, 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 um, that solves a lot of the problem. And in addition to that, instead of having one pencil on the table, there's, there's a box of single use golf pencils so people are not using the same, um, the same pencil. Also on the table, um, uh, our hand sanitizer, disposable gloves, sanitizing wipes uh, for both the voters and interviewers to use. Um, and so, so with the combination of the table, not approaching directly, but standing at a safe uh, six foot distance, having the mask and then pointing out the safety uh, supplies, the sanitizer, et cetera, on the table, we find, we're finding that, that that seems to be working well uh, and that these measures are, are effective. Um, Interviewers who have worked exit polling prior to COVID-19 have said they haven't really noticed a difference in exit polling now versus the past in terms of their ability to get, inter, uh, to get voters to fill out the questionnaire or in terms of their uh, interactions with, with voters. And most importantly, the response rates have been similar to the past and, and in some cases higher. And this, this might seem surprising, again, given that we're in the middle of a pandemic with COVID-19, but it, it makes sense if you think that if you think about the people who have chosen to go to a polling place to vote, um, these people are willing to get to the polling place uh, where they have to go inside. Uh, sometimes they have to stand in a long line. Then they have to come in contact with the precinct officials. They have to sign in. And then they either have to vote on a voting machine or on a questionnaire that uh, is handed to them or a voting machine that other people have voted on. So it's, that, it's not that much of a stretch if someone's willing to go through that, that when they uh, exit the polling place, that they, that they would agree to uh, fill out a questionnaire uh, if, safety, uh, if specific safety um, precautions are being followed. Another change um, with COVID-19 is that polling places are becoming much busier. They are much busier because there are few, fewer polling places open and so they're more crowded. And so with busier polling places, we have to keep a close eye on the interviewing rate, again, so as not to overwork the interviewer and so they, they don't run out of questionnaires. But also it may be necessary to send more than one interviewer to very large polling places 
that have consolidated many precincts um, in, in order to, to um, get the right number of uh, interviews. Normally, it's just one interviewer per polling location, um, but it, it, it may be necessary if there's a lot of consolidation to send multiple interviewers uh, to polling locations. And another important uh, change on election night this year is that it will take much longer to count the vote across the country. I mentioned Edison collects the vote for us. I think that's gonna be a lot slower. We're already seeing this in recent primaries. Um, the, vote counter has been, the vote count has been much slower because more people are voting by mail and many states are not equipped to handle the influx of a mail ballots that are coming in. Mail ballots take longer to count. The um, signatures have to be checked to the voting rolls. The envelope needs to be opened. Each ballot needs to be manually uh, either counted or fed into a machine. And so what this means is that the vote count on election night will be quite a bit slower. And as a result, it will take longer to make projections in key races. And it's very likely that we will not know the winner of the uh, presidential race on election night unless it's a blowout. So we are expecting that a large number of races, much larger than usual, uh, will, be un, will be unprojected or not projected on election night. And so we're talking more about election week um, than, than about election night. So um, for all these reasons, uh, the 2020 general election is shaping up to be the most challenging of any election that I've covered in my 26 years that I've been doing this. And so I think it, it certainly will be uh, an interesting one. So I will uh, stop at this point and, at, and am happy to entertain any questions. Thanks, Dan. That was a uh, real interesting and obviously a data packed uh, presentation. Uh, we use the chat function in Zoom for members of the audience to ask their questions and then uh, we'll pass them along to Dan for his response. I think that one uh, element of the of the exit poll operation that's illustrated by your uh, presentation, Dan, is that obviously uh, th this is not a static operation. That uh, the the environment of voting has changed a great deal in the U.S., and you have to be um, alert to these changes and how to incorporate them into your data collection methodology. Yeah, that's exactly right. And like I said, when I started doing this in 1994, things were just very easy because there was very low uh, non-coverage, low absentee and early voting. And so it, it, it was all pretty straightforward. And, and as, we've, as we've gone on, like I said, that, that percentage has increased. And what we're seeing this year with COVID-19 is just a whole bunch of new uh, concerns and, and issues that we have to deal with. But, but I think, um, you know, the, the people at Essen are, are, are very smart. They've, they've been testing things out. And I, I, the, you know, some things you cannot prepare for. Um, we don't know what November will look like. We're going to be as prepared as we can. And, and hopefully, we'll be able to um, implement these procedures in a safe way. One uh, question that we have is, do you rotate the order of candidates on the exit poll ballot? No, we have not, we have not done that and we do not do that. In your experience, have you been able to find counties or, or polling places that helped you predict better than the final results? No, I mean, I, I think, the, you know, maybe you're referring to, um, uh, bellwether counties or bellwether precincts that that's not something we look at um th there's been some good work showing that those you know they, what may be predictive at one point is not predictive into the future and so we we rely on a sample of precincts and we rely on a census of all counties and 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 put them into models and you know uh, using past data to you know impute for missing precincts and missing counties and so that's, we, we've just found that, you know, trying to stick with more basic models is a better way to go than looking at, at bellwethers. 
Uh, one question is, uh, is there such a thing as a redshift in exit polling? I'm not sure what you mean by redshift. Um, I, I, I think I, maybe what the question is getting at is, is one particular party or another over, overrepresented in exit polls. And so what we have seen over time is on average, Democrats are more likely to fill out the exit poll questionnaire. So we make an adjustment for that. That overstatement varies considerably over time and state to state. But, but that is something we've seen. And, and we've also noticed that that is somewhat related to education and that by, by truing up education or having a better adjustment for education that makes the vote, count, uh, the vote estimate more accurate. We have a question from somebody in the audience who says that they're asking for a friend. Okay. <laughs> what is it like to be in the quarantine, AKA a embargo room and how has that changed over the years? Well, I will say it's, it's one of my least favorite things to do because you're, you're, you're cooped up for six hours in a small room, no communication to the outside world. But the, the, the hardest part is you have to analyze all the state exit polls, all the models, the national exit poll. You just, there's a ton of data that has to be analyzed. And I myself, my goal is to go through every state exit poll, kick the tires on everything and the national exit poll. And so when I come out of the quarantine room at five o'clock, I'm already exhausted. And the night is just starting at that point because I'm gonna be up all night anyway. But on the other hand, the benefit of it is um, for the few of us who get to see the data early, we have a really good feel about what is going on. And it actually would be worse if I didn't get to see the data and I had to start cramming at five o'clock, uh, going into election night in the first poll closing times at seven o'clock Eastern, I, I wouldn't have a really as good of a feel for the data. So while I don't really enjoy doing it, I, I, I appreciate that I do have the opportunity to do it. And do they have high quality pizza or, or not? <laughs> well, that is, that is varied. <laughs> okay. I got another question for you. Um, has the decision desk and exit polling operation uh, generally been immune to the recent efforts by some to denigrate the news media? I, I think it has been. Um, at least at ABC News, the way we operate is the decision desk is removed from the studio and we are removed from any um, outside pressure. Uh, so, so far, when we make projections, you know, it's because we've been accurate, we haven't gotten any pushback. It's very possible uh, in this November's election, uh, one side or the other may try to contest and say, well, that projection is not right. Um, but, but so far, I haven't seen, I haven't seen that in, in terms of the projections and the decision desks. I, I have a couple more questions, Dan, but I think somebody has pointed out that you may still be sharing your screen and they, and they want to see you answer the questions. Okay. Okay. How's this? <laughs> Great. Um, let me go, let me go back here. Um, how much pressure, one question is, uh, how much pressure is there inside the decision room? Do you ever hear, come on, Dan, NBC just called that state. Why can't we? No, no, there's, there's no pressure like that because, you know, so I've been around a long time. Uh, I was at ABC News for the 2000 election. Some, some of you may not remember that, but um, uh, Florida was misprojected, uh, was projected incorrectly a couple of times on that night. I was on the team, uh, but I wasn't in charge at that time. But there were, there were congressional investigations and a, a lot of inquiries. Um, and as a result of that, um, we've, we've been cut off from any kind of pressure. And so, I, you know, I'm told to get it right. And of course, we need to be timely. But, but I've been doing this so long. When, when we're confident, we will make that projection based on the data we're looking at. And, and I, so I, I, don't, I, I don't get any pressure and I don't feel any pressure. I mean, the pressure is just that we're dealing with a lot of states and a lot of races and a lot of data. 
and just you know keeping up with all of it. But we we really just let the data guide us in terms of the projections. And uh, do you have any comments about the role of exit polls when elections become contested? Sure. Um, so you know exit polls are are great for the use to which we put them, projecting elections, uh, analyzing the crosstabs. In terms of um, using them to compare to election results to see if the, the election results are, are accurate, I, I don't think that's a good use for exit polls. The exit polls are not that precise given the sampling error and then given you know, other kinds of, of non-response error that we try to adjust for. So, so I, I don't see exit polls as a way to, to vet or to verify election results. And plus, we also don't have, um, you know, and, and if, you, if you want to look at a more granular level, at the precinct level, there's even more sampling error um, because it's, it's, only about 100, it's only about 100 respondents. I have one more question and uh, then we'll uh, call it an evening. Uh, how can you tell, uh, how can a, a, a listener or a viewer tell if an exit poll is credible? In, in the past election in my country, there were different projections of the outcome of the elections from different exit polling firms. Yeah, I, I think it really comes down to the methodology. I mean, that, that's how I evaluate polls and surveys. Uh, does it use a, a solid sampling methodology? Uh, do they deal with non-coverage? Uh, do they have a good weighting for non-response? Great. Um, I want to uh, emphasize this point that uh, Dan made earlier about the availability of the data through the Roper Center. For those of you who are interested in elections and uh, analysis of election related data. And I want to thank Dan very much for coming to speak with us this evening. A very interesting presentation. Uh, you uh, in the audience uh, remember that we have been recording Dan's presentation and it will be up on the ICPSR YouTube channel uh, sometime tomorrow. Thanks again, Dan, for being with us. Well, thank you, Mike, for uh, inviting me. I, I appreciate it.